Hello everyone, today we talk about 8th century Frankish cavalry from a political, technical and social point of view, explaining a bit the causes and the consequences of the impressive Carolingian horsemanship development that we are all very aware of. Compared to all the videos I've made, we haven't talked uh, Frankish warfare that much as it deserves, but uh, these are these dives, at least into this case some broader critical um, uh, method of some sort, then we will be touching on certain topics that deserve in turn much of a of another dive uh, in turn. And uh, I have already discussed part of these topics, I remember for sure in some question and answer video, like um, at least especially at the beginning of Schwerpunkt, there was some in proportion some greater amount of strictly military historical interest and of course the development of western uh, medieval western knighthood and cavalry and chivalry uh, is of course an important enough topic as we were just saying to you know to to eventually uh, trigger to, to rise some curiosity and uh, wanting explanation etc and uh, in those videos I answered fundamentally to, to, to various questions that were predictably um, orienting themselves towards sort of this technologistic bias like how is that the cavalry came to be like this and you know most of the is it the stirrup is it the um, you know couche langs uh, you know grip let's say uh, etc. It, it, these are just consequences mostly of a much more deeply political and social background that we're not going to look at much per se. Like, you know, that I uh, say I loathe structuralism and the idea that fundamentally you have to study warfare just because it's functional to politics and society. Well, also politics and society are functional to warfare, so I uh, I love these dives into purely military history uh, at some point that yeah I mean I think I distribute also in in a uh, in a tidier way I, I I don't talk about that only right in fact this video is 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 military history but it is also answering you know, why certain things came to be the, the ones they are but one has always to focus in order to answer the military question also on the military matter you can't um, this is really an advice for everyone because it seems to me, at least as I have gone through, um, say, uh, most of the university, then, you know, in academic times, at least I'm free to write whatever I want. But the idea, the advice, the, the criticism, it's, it's always, but what's the social background of this? And, and skipping entirely the military one, right? It's not to say, you know, start from the military one and then you obviously provide also with a social explanation. Um, so one has always to answer the question of practically what what the hell is happening on the battlefield, which especially for these times it, it, it's all pretty obscure. That's an, uh, pretty notorious. Like the anecdotes that I like to uh, always come up with is the fact that in the entirety of Carolingian military history, which, as you know, is pretty intense um, and uh, extensive, the only uh, battle that we are able to reconstruct tactically, which of course doesn't tell us much just about the individual, even warrior and, and gear, panoply, etc., is the one of Zunta, right? Uh, one, by the way, of, of the relatively few Carolingians' defeat against the Saxons, where, you know, incidentally, Carolingian cavalry screwed up fundamentally because of inexperience and uh, nervousness, etc. Or we'll be talking about that at some other point because it's, it's an important engagement. Um, but that, if you consider that as the exception, um, you realize how the rule that practically we know nothing about actual Carolingian tactics uh, is confirmed, right? We can understand, of course, through many also technical aspects, archaeology, uh, you know, iconography, etc. There is a lot, like you, here I have uh, many pictures from... Uh, you know, art of the time, etc. So that is very useful, but one thing is a drawing, another thing is understanding what was in fact happening on the battlefield. Equally, I think it's a waste of time to try to answer this 
um, you know, what is the cause or the consequence of what? You know, what what matters? Well, this is an abstract mental. Uh, it's better if I don't say what. Um, but it doesn't make any sense. What we have to track is what happens, what we can see, right? So uh, the in order in this race to increase the burden of weapons, as fundamentally you, you realize that's the trend. Um, whether the offensive aspect preceded the, and provoked the defensive one or vice versa, uh, basically, is a way is a waste of time um, of a of a question uh, and an answer to find. Uh, the interdependence does not lend itself to a nucleation, and so one has to look at the the broader picture and trying to dimension the phenomenon mostly from that. Right. Today, by the way, we stick to the Frankish side of the story, Frankish society and technology and politics. So we're, we're not going to investigate much. Uh, we will do it briefly at the end. The uh, otherwise notorious impact that, of course, cavalry as a whole, not just the Frankish one, in, say in Europe, what had been having from the previous centuries. Right. We will... Uh, we have made actually lots of videos about uh, Eurasian steppes warfare. We have observed in them also lots of sedentary populations, and explicitly so. Like I used to make like a couple of nomadic peoples, and then say a sedentary one that was interacting with them um, at different times in history, mostly during the various waves uh, coming from the steppes. And of course, pointing out how, of course, if you want to study medieval cavalry medieval European cavalry, you, you can't but, of course, look at the interdependence with, with the step with, uh, mostly, I would say, because there, there's this answer that especially has been overly emphasized uh, without proof that, I've, that I could trace that, you know, cavalry received a, such a great boost mostly from the East or the, during the Crusades or whatever, BS, I call BS on that. Western cavalry was already more advanced, uh, at that point, and the and its development has a lot to do, in fact, with, with the actual Carolingian uh, background. In other words, it would have developed more or less along the same pattern, even without that actual massive influence from the steps. That wasn't, however, decisive. And basically, by the times of the Crusades, you have already, say, continental Europe having produced this on its own, right, from the post Carolingian kingdoms and from those. You know, expanding further, and especially, we will not. This is not the video to explain that specifically, but you know that the cradle of this is basically today's northeastern France, Belgium. Th those are the places where, eventually, also from later, uh, real, the real Western way of war sort of sort of emerged and poured, basically, overflowed all, all around, right, during the following centuries, and that's something that you're accustomed to listen from my uh, even just a political and social history videos, but there is a playlist that is titled Medieval Knighthood that um, basically deals mostly with this um, equestrian and, and chivalric aspects uh, just per se. In fact, I will add this video to that playlist as well. Now, what is certain is that burden Right, the, the weight of cavalry presupposes and above all makes necessary a choice that is going to be technical and military uh, between two divergent groups. One is the requiring of agility, practicality, low cost. The other is heaviness, impact force, high costs, and long training in, uh, internships. And the most acute of you will have immediately understood that, uh, also from the historical uh, political background, that these two options correspond respectively to a people's uh, or an elite type of war. Right, so we are in the 8th century. We all know what happens from this time onwards, which had actually been happening from quite a while, arguably from the same late antiquity, right? In early medieval warfare we see, uh, even among the, the least uh, stratified populations, an, in, uh, an increase in, and in actually a, a real dominance 
uh, of, of uh, cavalry, right? Uh, we're talking, in fact, also the, the Romano-Germanic uh, dimension we're uh, observing for the for the Merovingians, not just for the Carolingians. Again, it, it's also wrong to assume that it, the Carolingians invented this. No, it, it was something going on from a long time. The Gallo-Roman Frankish society was already on those tracks, right? These guys were just implementing it in, in practical ways, just also to make war with impressive logistics, whatever. But it was mostly a a political uh, issue, right? Uh, it was about having the Frankish kingdom cohesive, which, as you know, for a long time it wasn't the case, but everything derives eventually a military capacity from that, right? We, uh, You see how the cycle randomly provides us with important links. Just the other day I made a video about uh, the, uh, the, the 8th century Longobard army. And we were talking, in fact, about the Franks, the, the Longobards, uh, for, during the, the conquest of Italy. And um, we pointed out already the major dynamics there behind the, the two powers, the, their military organizations, etc. Individually, they were pretty similar, right? Um, there wasn't much of a difference, if any, uh, approximately between a Frankish or a Longobard warrior, or a panoply, let's say. Um, but it's the system that was quite different. In, admittedly, the Carolingians were really the exception in Europe, right, in many ways. Uh, but today we stick again mostly to, in fact, that, um, that cauldron, right, and how things had, came, uh, had come to be, because it's obvious that by the, the 8th century, the choice was made, right? Certain history books tend to, um, let's say, not pretend, but at least to, to, to emphasize the fact that up to this, the 8th century, and so the rise of the Carolingian Empire, th many peoples in Central Western Europe would have allegedly lived in a sort of, you know, free mode, right? With still the individual guy providing with his own equipment, not having lords, whatever. Um, ever since the Germans had settled in the former lands of the Roman Empire, and in, in most cases already when they were living within the same barbaricum, uh, the elites had taken over, right? It is true, of course, that this was happening uh, in the most politically fragmented realities with, with less, um, you know, impetus, right? It's obvious that, I don't know, Saxon society or Longobard society, even though being very different uh, in their own, they had maintained... Uh, say a, a more equal distribution of wealth independently from the absolute difference um, Gaul, the Franks were really different right they had already they had managed actually to preserve great part of the actually the Roman Latifundium as such uh, that had shrunk had been sort of remolded in different ways but essentially the, the elite right the idea that wealth was concentrated into the hands of, of actually very few people that could, however, we'll see it better later, in virtue of this, uh, essentially spend a life uh, time of training on horseback with heavy equipment, so which cost an enormous lot, uh, and that ran society that protected fundamentally the community that had at some point accepted that state of affairs and would fur further entrench into that, especially after the, the end of the Carolingian Empire, and so further seniorialization in spite of the actual fragmentation, etc. Because the Franks had really molded also the countries they had conquered, um, is the, the actual explanation, right? The, the 8th century, it marks definitely the rise of an empire that, that changed the history of Europe and the world forever. Um, but um, this doesn't actually... Uh, alter within itself the ingredients that had already been used, right, to mold that uh, ultra-elite system that was typical of uh, Frankish society in, say, n not the, the, the one that of the migration era, but the one that, in fact, had come to be now, in a completely, you know, fully centralized, uh, heavily landed, and, in fact, very much aristocratically uh, uh, identity uh, fashion, right? We'll talk about it for because Frankish history is, is basically about this. Once you understand that, everything is easier to understand. Uh, other peoples were not like them, it is true, but let's say the tendency to 
senior realization had been there. We've seen it even among the more civilized Longobards in the south that there were clienteles that the same Longobard kings were sort of fostering further from uh, a more sort of egalitarian, the, the, the more traditionally egalitarian background of the people by the 8th century. And so you can argue, because this is something that happens also, I don't know, in the Byzantine world. Just the other day I made a video about Constantine the Ninth, the basically the, the, the triumph of pro, the Pronia system. We have seen it, uh, when was it recently, with, also with the Ikta for the Islamic peoples. Eventually, you know, the the great statal uh, structures um, and then had survived fundamentally from the Roman one in the Mediterranean. Um, under the Byzantines, the Arabs, um, this was also for Spain, uh, that had, had preserved uh, throughout the Visigoths, however, that were crippled a bit by, the, like the Franks, by dynastic issues, and but even more by actual fragmentation of uh, territorial fragmentation. Uh, the preservation of the same large estate where it existed before. Uh, it's a complex topic, it's not so easy to digress on, but this system somehow eroded, collapsed, right? Uh, you have the, the Normans taking over places like uh, even Anglo-Saxon England that, as we've seen recently, they made some videos about the tribal heritage, etc. It was not a feudal system. Right, uh, the Normans do the same in Sicily, in southern Italy, that had remained in the, within the Byzantine uh, long or Islamic tradition, sort of non-feudal up to that point. It is something that the Seljuks make uh, in the uh, in the Caliphate. Right, everything sort of in the in these high medieval centuries tends to privatize, and the most su successful system, paradoxically, are able to statalize in the West out of this feudal glue. Right, and at that point, there are still feudal monarchies, feudal states, but as you know, they evolved with as hell of powers, like you know, England, France, Sicily, the Iberian monarchies, etc. Um, but that's later. That's not what we discuss today. Um, so you can argue that uh, you know it could have. There, there's nothing strange at least that by the eighth century, the choice for a, a heavy cavalry that reflected this system. Um, together with all its set of, of values, had been made among the Franks. The Merovingians, again, had been the same, right? Don't let yourself be fooled by the fact that they fragmented for dynastic reasons, and yes, that they lived among some of the least uh, dynamic times of the early Middle Ages. They didn't have so many resources like the Carolingians, but still, right, it was mostly a matter of putting things back uh, together, having new targets, uh, fueling this uh, military through the the actual the the bait of the co of the loot of the conquests, right? And that's what the Carolingians eventually succeed in, also because they are dynastically lucky to have that continuity. Charlemagne, Louis the Pious, uh, so the the death of their brother, so as they remain as sole rulers, a bit like Dagobert back in the day, that reunites everything. Because the other guys had died later on, Charles the Third, even you know, as the last. Uh, last Carolingian emperor basically does the same, but even at that point to no no avail because the system had overexpanded and all these um, uh, knights we can start calling them start eating up the system from the within because they uh, there is not much to that the empire can keep expanding on. A bit like the Ro the Roman Empire had worked in similar ways and others that we can't discuss now. Uh, um, so, when we look at the panoply, we see that alongside the sword, the brunia armor, the composite bow, also the heavy spear established itself in the military art of the time. Right? Speaking of the composite bow, yes, the Carolingians did not really have that. You know, mostly they used the, the simple, um, say, in Europe at least, uh, the, the bow has been made since prehistory in in the same identical way everywhere, right? Um, but archery is important among the Carolingians. The, there is a lot of, in fact, Eastern influence by the uh, by the Byzantines, by the by the Avars, uh, eventually by the Magyars. Uh, the Slavs inherit here and there. Well, not so much only truth, but I mean, in the frontier area, right? You find a lot of of a different horsemanship. Right, it is best exemplified in the clashes between the Ottomans and the Magyars, 
right? Um, but the we'll see now that of course a heavy cavalry needs also a heavy spear for shock charges, and yet not all heavy spears are the same. And in fact, in this specific field, the Frankish innovation would not consist in heaviness. Um, just for the sake of clarity, even the Contus was uh, of the cataphracts of the previous centuries um, had been a, a heavy spear. At that time, where this type of cavalry had fundamentally faded, there was a tendency towards a weapon which, unlike the Contus, had to be handled with only one arm. Right? made lots of videos about the Sarmatians, the Iranian peoples, uh, I made something about uh, Roman cataphract, we will keep talking about them, but, and we do not have time for digressing, but to make the long story short, the cataphract with his heavy um, sort of pole, uh, barge pole, right, that, that's basically what the contest is, is something very specific, um, and also relatively recent within the same steps warfare, it had been not much of a uh, say a random or say inside characteristics of of these of this military culture, but rather a response to the heavier uh, sedentary populations. Right? It seems that even that Alexander's conquests, right, his victory over the Scythians brought the latter to develop this, it reached the peak um, in our in our Sassid Parthian times, and even though from say, late antiquity we see this thing copied a bit by the Romans, still use it, used by the Sassanians, the actual cataphract at that point had somehow, first of all the Romans uh, did not really succeed in particular uh, with its use. Uh, we saw it in the Battle of Strasbourg. Um, the Parthians, as you know, were never kind of a, a military might. It's not the cataphracts that solved their problems. And the Sassanians actually abandoned right that ultra-heavy form of cataphracts. Actually, they split. They were sort of half-armored knights. I mean, massive, don't get me wrong. There was a lot of that a fierce, heavy cavalry tradition surviving in part in Central Asia, etc. I made lots of videos already. The Eurasian Steps playlist explains all this in, in detail, right? Uh, Eurasian Steps series, um, and but we will keep talking about individual types of troops. Uh, we'll look at arm and armor, etc. Because we haven't even began, right? But it's important to start from, uh, at some point. But to make the long story short, um, they had split the, uh, say, the Properly, the this uh, this have they had diminished the weight of heavy cavalry. Doesn't matter how actually feudal this could be, the cataphract had made its time. Uh, I had in store, incidentally, just a video about the sixth century Byzantine um, uh, half-armored horse, as such. Uh, but I will be making it hopefully, you know, uh, in a in a long time and quite a hand in uh, the preparation of some content. And um, the uh, in the West you don't have this anymore. First of all, the early Middle Ages saw uh, a great um, material poverty. So actually, cataphract cores were affordable, and they would be affordable also later on again in the Byzantine Empire. Think about the Nikephorian ones, just for a limited amount of time, and especially with a massive, but I mean a massive, statal uh, injection. Um, and uh, here, in spite of the enormous wealth that the Carolingian lords individually enjoyed, like there wasn't really a need uh, to develop still that form. Right? You needed something more handy, yet heavy, and especially collectively trained. Um, that the cataphract, at least in its heaviest fashion, had somehow lost over time, like back in the day, the Sakas, yes, had even the model of the heavy cavalry, the shock cataphract, basically, with um, archery capacities. And this because, again, there, there was an age of heroes in the world, and then we fell from it, and, and I'm not really kidding. Um, the sedentary world does not have that much of a pressure. 
but it has a lot of wealth and so it can organize through this surplus what essentially you see uh, in the Carolingian army. And remember that the steppe exists because the, the senator world is stronger, right? So uh, you can't, even looking at the migration, you claim that, you know, senator world was at any point military inferior compared to these guys. So it's a very long story, but it's also important always to remember. However, the um, Frankish uh, heavy horseman spear didn't have... Uh, had, um, albeit not dribbling like the old javelins, or not only used in that way, had to be rather first held suspended from the arm, which formed an acute angle at the bottom then, but it's not clear from when, um, tightened under the armpit. So the couche lacks uh, charge, right? This is at least the ending point. It's something we start seeing fully you know, from the mid 12th century, there is an enormous, or even slightly later, as a, as the true standard, right, third, fourth of the 12th century, where that sort of concept of heavily defined elite knighthood sort of emerges. The militia is born technically in the 10th century. That's where the militas came around. We can't be talking of, of about knights, right, within a uh, also, a political and social context, at best we could do that only for, say, the Alan um, uh, heavy horsemen of the migration. We made a bit about uh, the Alan's role in Gaul and surely the legacy that they left for the development of, of Frankish uh, heavy cavalry. Um, but uh, too much has been written also about this, like when when did you know the, the the western cavalry adopt fully you know the the couche lanks the chocolate cavalry all, all pretty well lined up and uh abandoning the sense of you know using this the the lanks uh the spear as a lance to throw in it uh even as a javelin whatever this is uh, also a nonsensical question meaning that throughout all history uh spears have been used in the all the possible imaginable ways Right. Um, there is no doubt of this. You can can uh, use it overarm, underarm, uh, under the armpit. You can throw it. This kept happening uh, all over. And while it is true, of course, that the systematization more or less follows the the pattern that we explained now. Right. If you look at the Bayeux tapestry, for example, you still see guys throwing for their spears to soften up the Anglo-Saxon shield wall um, from the Norman side. You see that. Some of them do not even have the stirrup yet, right? So that was still a transitional phase. You can imagine what the 8th century really was. The most important thing, however, is that the direction here, in a time in which the Franks again re-expanded as an empire, um, uh, let's say the Carolingians better, because we have to stress the dynastic and so elite dimension of, of this, uh, of an essentially aristocratic movement. It's not the Franks as a people. Right, it's their elites that really do this, and and that manage to impose this on the other peoples as well. Um, and their elites, it's of course the peoples contributed heavily, as we, we understood now, for all the cultural, logistical, moral support, and so they are vital as well. They could have not existed one without the other. It were a functional theme, but. It's um it's at this point that the necessity of making the the, the Frankish army something more scholarly competent strategically, tactically, technically, logistically, etc., that sort of boosts further the necessity also of a collective training of a uh, an individual be uh, behavior bent to the functionality of the of the group right of the unit that otherwise would have been ineffective would have been in danger right and that's when arms and armor adapt to the type of tactics that also derive from this right it's not the stirrup was already there from from quite a while right seemingly the hours had brought this but it didn't change anything right we do not have better charges because somebody discovered that they could use the stirrup. First of all, there, there is a ferocious debate even about that, what kind of stirrups they would use, because some could be of organic material and we wouldn't be documented about it 
um, in any case. But of course, every idiot knows more or less how to, to remain a horse ba- on horseback more more stably to, to some degree. Um, the syrup, as any other technology, predominantly comes around because of something that needs its use, uh, not that needs um, the technology to happen as such. Um, and we see this quite well so because stirrups were around even in civilian context we have some, I don't know, there, there's the grave of our long bird uh, little girl who was buried with with stirrups at some, some point before this time uh, that was just to teach her how to horse ride, right? And so being a professionally drilled mounted unit is a completely different thing. Um, and it could have happened only, of course, within the um, private clientele that, that Franks had already been cultivating because uh, essentially of the absence even of a state, really. Um, but in this still florid and sort of uh, well, well-built well um, post-Roman goal, and uh, I could digress, of course, also on the mental structures of the Franks, the fact that, again, it's the moral force that really makes this happen. It's not the technical thing. That's just passive. Alone, it doesn't make anything. It, someone knows how to use that for, for, for a purpose, for a motivation, uh, etc. Right? But we start seeing, of course, from the times, especially of Charles Martel, that reclaims um, basically the, the entirety of the former Merovingian empire territorially and uh, especially confiscates a lot of land uh, from guys that had previously lords that had previously autonomized to to reward uh, with the same uh, his own uh, military retinues that you start seeing that fact professional system of sort of prepaid military service in exchange for in fact the uh, the land that was not could not quite be controlled again without a state directly by functionary. So you had this loyal guys with whom you had fought, you had ro- a risen to power, etc., and that you would reward by settling, um, I don't know, some hundred of kilometers away, knowing that they would control that land and that in case of need they would come fighting for you and without needing to pay them because the land would do that by itself, right? This was still a very, especially north of the Alps, like a, a, a brutally. Uh, primitive and you know very still um, you know barter nature based uh, reality right the, the Carolingians of course they had their own cities they had their own in- impressive logistical system and they, we must absolutely make a video about this but it fundamentally all revolved around this right the Franks were literally only and exclusively about this weapons horses and land once you understand this you have understood Frankish history there's literally nothing else if not an enormous amount of bloodshed, which uh, is uh, true, w- w- what uh, these guys are tampered through, right? Um, the Carolingian gifts to the Abbasid Caliphate in that were quite telling. <laughs> you know, the the Arabs would tell I don't know sophisticated um, uh, clockworks, water clockworks, you know, precious silks. All the, the Franks sent good horses, you know, good weapons, and basically they 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 manifest what, what was really what really meant the world, what was their world, right? Um, so the spear that develops out of this is actually lighter than the contus, that is not needed in that way. Um, the um, it, it was a weapon to be used in shock combat, uh, no doubt, uh, the penetration of which uh, penetration capacity, which no longer depended, by the way, only on the strength of the warrior's arm, but on the weight of the man-horse duo block, which, thanks to the usual support points of the saddle and of the stirrups, could be unloaded onto the shaft. Uh, when we look at the iconography. Uh, we realize that, of course, there is a lot of artistic license. When we look at the Bayeux tapestry, so we are at the end of the 11th century, we uh, still see, if, as we were saying before, the, the two types of spear hand, uh, still handling together, like the old one, like a javelin, the new heavy one, right? Um, it, it's difficult even to 
differentiate them because again uh, they were somehow similar they um, the levels of standardization were were variable there were still peoples around the the broader Frankish culture to which also the Normans belonged at this point in the Bayeux um, tapestry context like the Bretons still made because they didn't have much of a feudal society on their own yet they would um, at least well, this time they were transitioning, but saying Charlemagne's times, they they quite uh, they they didn't right. They were more similar to the sort of tribal migration era model, um, but still use sort of the uh, at least more frequently the javelin type, right? This doesn't mean at any point that any of these peoples didn't have either of the two. Of, of course, also in previous times, there wasn't just a contest; it was something heavier uh, next to also the javelin, right? But things had been ever even more promiscuous before. At this point, the separation is neater, also because for the more elite troops you have, uh, like as we've seen it before in other contexts where heavy cavalry was uh, really very heavy, and they, they realized that it was better for it to specialize in that shock charge, lots of other specialized troops, lighter troops, that would... Um, carry out a different uh, job right on the field and in Western Europe it's it's mostly the infantry actually that does that cavalry seems to it has different degrees like of, of heaviness we made recently a video about the sergeants etc but also we know that towards the 13th century yes there are other types of cavalry that at that point are really uh, specializing as missiles etc but overall right the the dominant role of cavalry in the West is more just shock charges, uh, not like in the East. The more East you go, there you start seeing things uh, radically changing, right? So in the 12th century, let's say that the old handling of the spear had no longer been used for centuries in a, uh, in a relevant way within Western warfare, nor it could have been, let's say, within Western, Western let's say, the Frankish, Post Carolingian world, right? Um, at least as it had been before, to some degree. Again, lighter troops still with throwing javelins existed there. He was even the heavies uh, using that um, by this ha time of Hastings. But again, the trend could have not gone otherwise, given the heaviness of the spears used just um, for how cavalry had developed at that point, which is just part of a bigger system, right? It corresponded to um, the classical sources uh, it was iconographically easier to render, sort of more spectacular as well. So the um, what you see in the pictures is not, of course, naturally how it technically was. And this is valid for uh, at least, you know, most of the times. Uh, this is valid for any era as such. Uh, the two-handed contest would have been too cumbersome. Uh, it would have dangerously unbalanced the knight. We know that the steps, cataphracts, that literally were also mounting impressive beasts, but had this incredibly heavy equipment, again, that, that uh, covered them in, in metal, right, horse and knight, etc. In order to, to handle the, the contest, uh, could not uh, do so with a with a bridle, and so they first of all they need horses to hand to, hand, to literally m move just at at command, right, with a minimal uh, motion or ward. But they had also massive strap systems that we'll see at some point that uh, kept them on ho on horseback, right? There were so many different. Again, it's mostly speculative because we unfortunately haven't a, a, a photo of a, you know step cataphract of how they actually fought. But we think that they, they had a, a very complex system of organic um, belts that uh, kept them safely on horseback. We know from some uh, sources, like, uh, for example, a 12th one, if I'm not wrong, from the Reconquista, telling us, literally on that case, that uh, the, the Spanish, uh, the, the Christian Spanish knights would literally use some chains to tie themselves to the saddle because at impact during the cavalry charges and they did cavalry always did smash into one another it's myth that they wouldn't um 
they would be literally catapulted uh, from the horse. Otherwise, this had been happening, right? Um, and consider that those were still were already pretty heavy knights. So that gives you a dimension of, of the forces involved and the danger, right? Also for the, the older cataphracts, it's not just being covered in metal that helps you. That mostly der derived from the need of of step warfare to parry hails of arrows, right? But it wasn't because of the complications um, of shock uh, cavalry charge that was were needed just to cope with uh, the the heaviest enemies that these knights would have to cope with. Um, and another thing uh, of of the contest, it's not just you couldn't quite handle the, the bridle um, safely, but you you couldn't quite use the shield. Albeit, back in the day, the heaviness of the cataphracts um, really rendered the shield sort of useless. This was true, uh, at least if not smaller types of shields, uh, just something to you could tie to your to your arm. Um, in a, in a way or another, this is something that even I don't know foot pikemen uh, did right. It it's an, can be an extra protection, but you can't quite use it during um, in in melee. Uh, very uh, very refinedly so of course it would have been useless for a Frankish knight at that point to to adopt that ultra heavy equipment that was molded in a in a not just in a very different but by now dysfunctional like outdated and uh, irreplicable context right so don't think that the cataphract just per se was, if not from a mental point of view, what technically these guys were trying to to reach ideally, right? There is all a psychological aspect to this that we can't simply digress on because it entails, aside from these techniques, what was the ideal warrior that these guys were embodying, right? Also what certain mythologies had uh, brought on the fore, like uh, we we shouldn't be surprised really to to uh, when imagining to try at least to 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 think of what a Carolingian horseman would uh, believe right in his system of values to see you know pretty nightmarish uh, uh, beliefs imageries. Uh, in um, related to the old, uh, let's say, also pagan background that again was not really had not really erased uh, those beliefs, especially in, in the lay context. Right, warriors were ma leaving without too much by being Christian, still fully uh, invested in the previous values that, in fact, had not technically even changed. Like Christianity had, on the contrary, tried to boost some of those further. For practical purpose, and you know, the, the the one of war was always the same after all. So, it's it's also another topic I covered in multiple videos. But that say the the myth that Christianity lowered the combativeness of the it, it's it, it's nonsense. Right? It's it's something that at best you can see having happened in parallel with Christianity. In the moment in which the same peoples, even when they were pagan, had been losing confidence in the capacity of twisting faith, um, and uh, you know th this had occurred as as a huge trauma just with the collapse of the Roman Empire, right? Or at least its universal dimension, uh, and it had invested peoples like the Franks, etc. So it's a much broader cultural moral issue. It doesn't actually have to do with Christianity per se, in spite of the you know, only superficially sort of idea of loving and peaceful concept. That's not really to be understood in a, say, earthly fashion, right? If you read the Bible, uh, the Gospels, like that, it's it's not r really what it means. I should start making some theological uh, videos on this because those at least those values are perfectly compa compatible also with the of course incredibly violent lifestyle that these people had that's not a, say it would create a problem but not for the the thing itself but how it was declined 
early and so by which extent they failed uh, to to do it in the perfect way so we can't know exactly to which degree um, say an 8th century Frankish warrior would still imagine the ultimate uh, imperial ideal to uh, to embody as an individual fighter in any case um, here we're talking also about peoples that had not met too strongly the the Eastern, say the steppe influence as such I mean the Franks had to cope in Merovingian times with the other invasion of Germany for example they uh, surely knew of course what laid uh, in the East but um, the cataphract tradition had been little widespread even uh, among the East Germans that still the Franks at least um, notionally deemed or at least their descendants of those that remain of them um, better than the Franks themselves um, even though they were because of this military system already more advanced right by the 8th century again for very different political and social reasons so um, you can't argue that the cataphract had this great relevance in the development in the technical development of Charlemagne's uh, armies, not just cavalry. Uh, they, the, the the Franks, like the, the West Germans, developed their cavalry to a, to a, to a systemic degree in a sanitary style context when the cataphract experiment was now outdated in the same lens that had given rise to it. In the East, right? So, yes, a Frankish warrior of the sixth century surely had been around, um, had seen the world, had fought, uh, God knows where. But at home, right, uh, Frankish cavalry was sort of rarer, uh, especially before moving into Roman Gaul, uh, than uh, among the, say, the the gods. And the Longobards, right, that had had a much stronger influence from the steppes, from the magic people firsthand, right. So then everybody knew everything, but the capacity of developing that, or the, even just the need of doing so, was substantially different among these peoples, right. And the Germans, after all, um, aside from certain. Uh, military styles, think about, I don't know, lamellar armor for the longbirds, etc. Probably a, as a wall, right? Because these the elites tended to imitate a lot, especially the steppes rulers, because it was just a stronger way of of of, um, of government in their eyes. And they just needed to look like them, right? When they were under the hands or stuff like that. Um, they were, however, much more neatly... Uh, homogeneous in terms of arms and armor than, than we think. Right? There is no need, again, there are strong steps, influence, so let's think about the Niederzotzingen helmet, the, uh, the, again, the, the necessity to copy right, certain models from the East. But at the end of the day, you can't really distinguish um, in the broader Central European area, say in the 6th century, uh, a people from another. These were sedentary Germans we, we, and we see it from their mm, from their material culture and there are significant uh, stepped influences to say the least but they can't be they, they do not necessarily represent a type of warfare that uh, was foundationally um, part of the same in, uh, even to a to a relevant degree it's a bit like uh, those videos we made on why you could have a, a politic panoply in the Iron Age but and, and fighting with it, but literally having nothing to do with phalangitic warfare, right? Which is the case of the same Romans or the Etruscans who never had anything like a, 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 an Hellenic or politic phalanx in spite of you know the, the mythology built um, around that that has been completely debunked uh, historiographically. But it's here a bit the same. And this is to add 
uh, as I was saying before, I, I'm going against uh, the uh, a bit the idea of, of the steps influence uh, because, of course, the uh, product of of the earth right in Western Europe as such was much bigger. Like the output, the material availability, the political and the social structures built on that were enough to make Frankish feudalism emerge. Right, and no doubt, culturally, mentally, anthropologically, the Reiter Völker are there. Uh, some of these peoples and descendants of the same are surely informed by this. They remember that, they, they have it in their own mythology. But look again at the Longobards um, or the, the gods. Um, they're not by the 8th century what they had been in the 6th, right? Uh, they have themselves adapted to a very different lifestyle, probably the one of a territorial state of sort, and the Franks are basically there themselves, in spite of their privatistic um, uh, difficulties, but they also emerge from the same, from the same basis. There is a markedly Western European dimension that is already pretty similar, and that the Carolin and at, at the time, and that the Carolingians contribute to consolidate, to homogenize further, and to glue together. And the the proof being, in fact, in the 10th century, that all post-Carolingian kingdoms produce the same elite. Right? They are militas, and again, surrounding peoples were were doing similar things, but they didn't have often the same systemic basis, right? The, the Western one is vassalatic beneficiary. The, say, the Norse or Slavic one is still tribal. The Byzantine, the Arab one is statal. Um, and so you have different types of troops, and uh, the West has, in this sense, the most, the, the strongest heavy cavalry. You can't have a strong heavy cavalry without a feudal society. It just doesn't work, right? So... One has to always reflect on, in fact, w where the particular types of cavalry, like even the cataphracts, stand from. Because if you do not have the same background, you can't have the same thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's not just a matter of time. It's literally a matter of wealth distribution, how they uh, organize themselves, how they arrange themselves, what kind of environment to live in. And, of course, also how they, they solve it individually, what kind of enemies they have to cope with. Um, but, again... This enhances largely the, the differences. Originally, the steppes nomads had used an animal tail or a pen for avoiding overpenetration of the spear, right? Which I also don't know exactly how you know successful it would have been. Um, it would essentially correct at least the penetration force of the impact spear, preventing it from sticking too deeply into the target and therefore not being able to come out. That was um, the uh, the main problem, actually. Then it would be properly recovered, but um, when, um, say, there are even further problems when this happens on horseback, for which also uh, normally you would have, the knight as such would have multiple spears, at least an attendant that would provide him with. But in combat, it's extremely dangerous to have your weapon stuck into the enemy's body, not being able to extract that, because contrary to what you may see on movies, it takes often a, a, a huge lot to kill a person, right? Especially if they're adrenaline overloaded, they, they know they're going uh, to die, they want to take you down with them, they're out of their mind, they are at close range because you have just, you know, stopped them, and you can't pull the, your weapon out, and so maybe they're going to transfix you with, with their own. Um, uh, then if we have to digress into fencing proper, it's a bit of a more complex thing. But to make the long story short, uh, in the Carolingian era, we also witnessed the development uh, of a characteristic uh, shape of the of this stop uh, stopping bar, giving rise to a curious, elegant lily shaft. And more than an innovation, it was just the adaptation of the spear with stop bar already used by the Romans for hunting against large and dangerous games, such as bears and wild boars. Uh, a type of hunting weapon would essentially remain widespread in Europe, as we know 
for a long time, even after the invention of firearms, um, we perhaps can make a video about that. And of course, um, this, th these weapons in simpler form, simple designs of the stopping bar, etc., had been around uh, for a while because the, the function would be the same. It's not just about that, however, the elet, as or also called the little wings, uh, are of course useful in part to parry uh, enemy blows uh, as well. So you add a bit more of uh, room for, uh, say, some more sophisticated uh, fence, and this, these weapons would eventually evolve into um, also into different forms. There is all affiliation uh, relation of also. Uh, okay, we will talk about other weapons such as pole arms and so on, and where they they had emerged historically from. It was very, in fact, um, humble weapons originally. Um, and definitely there is a similarity between war and big game hunting. I mean, isn't it the same, right? You know, during hunting parties, um, you would behave more or less like during a tournament sometime. Um, you would see this already noted and theorized by the ancients, and this would be exacerbated in the single combat of the feudal age. Uh, it, um, it, it does make sense why the same weapon could pass from one context to, to another. Also note that in the feudal age spears, the stop bar later developed in the form of the penoncel, which was suitable especially for bearing uh, emblems, white for the emerging heraldic needs. Uh, the pennon, however, itself would be gradually abandoned to the extent that heavy cavalry in feudal times increasingly used the lengths as a weapon designed not much to wound, but rather to shatter, like to overrun the adversary, to, to especially unhorse him, right? This function for which the um, pen of become useless, even causing actual harm uh, to, the, to the user, becoming, for example, in, entangled in the opponent's hardness, or weapons. That's something you didn't want um, to happen. And part of, of the reason is, of course, that um, cavalry charges become ever more predominant, at least the, um, also the individual horsemen in a, in a more, say, individual men at arms in the later Middle Ages, in a still more individualistic uh, situation would be more likely just to smash into the enemy rather than stopping and, um, you know, battling him, uh, trying to have a stopping bar, like some kind of practical fencing purpose as we were uh, looking at. And if they had, if this uh, smashing, you know, lances for heavy impact had been, you know, uh, in fact being trapped into you know, the enemy finance or something like that, it could have created significant uh, problems in, a, in during the speed of, of, a, of a charge. Right? And um, there, there are concrete problems and ways in which you have, in fact, to use the uh, the spear, right? Part of the reason why the same Couchet length uh, grip had been introduced, because um, at certain speeds it's ever more complicated to... Um, especially against heavier opponents, to have a, a weapon that you can simply um, sort of let running behind you, which is how also more modern contemporary lancers were habituated of doing. There is all offense in practice to do so, but in fact, in times where in, where armor was practically not there anymore, and so weapons came to be especially more up there for wounding, for trespassing, whereas when you you see uh, the, the evolution of of the night of knightly armor, you realize that was mostly about the, the trauma, the the blunt um, impact that was uh, being was researched, and even with this, in fact, enormous force counterposed uh, with all the the body and uh, of the 
a knight on the horse, it still was extremely dangerous. I mean, the forces in tail were, were enormous, but trying to keep, to wound someone, to transpass something was was still feasible, right? Especially as long as um, plate armor was not around. But even there, you would say certain forces are really extraordinary. Uh, but at that point, it was mostly about, in fact, unhorsing the guy, giving him that hello smash that would manage to just uh, once hunt the horse, being just out of formation, out of you know his um, natural element, right, and having difficulties even to simply remount on horse. But it doesn't matter how, of course, ergonomic um, and uh, functional armor was, right? It's true that as Marshal Bouchicot really shows that the, the they could the, the the knights could perform stunts in them, but it was also exhausting, right, to move in them in the heat of an emergential situation, right, where you couldn't quite simply dose your energies like in a in a duel, right? So everything is much more messed up there and being unhorsed uh is uh basically the most important uh, goal there. And it happens through the smashing, so naturally the weapon would evolve, as you know, in even increasing the the weight. That's why the, the rest is literally invented at some point in the later Middle Ages, because the the, lengths, the the spear would be so so heavy that you literally couldn't lift it anymore with a single arm. We're at the end of the Middle Ages, right, so very distant from this time, um, however, the concept, say the purpose uh, for which this weapon was originally designed was in fact to deliver such a blow that could knock the opponent out uh, with that, hopefully, um, as a blow, as the, as the impact went, not because of a particularly fencing, sophistication, cutting capacities, or anything more sophisticated but this still needed in fact a, a, a very sophisticated system between the the knight the horse etc that we will also see better now because the increasing weight of the armament and the parallel development of the shock technique required horses to be trained in very particular ways so first of all they had to be selected for this straight running and head-on collision and for that just as much as for the knights you needed probably a psychological training not just uh, um, you know of course it's all mixed right body uh, and soul but you within the same breeds right you you must select uh, the horses that literally have a more aggressive character or at least they had they're more willing to in fact the what well, the stallion basically is, uh, as opposed to the run, the lighter runner, for the heaviest cavalry for smashing on into r ragingly, right? Even at the cost of self damage, we know that some horses really do that, and that's the ones you have to select because it is true that some horses do not step over corpses; they avoid smashing uh, into you know enemy lines, etc. But these horses like were trained specifically for doing and they would do that right so also the myth again that cavalry charges did not exist it was sort of a faint at least the smashing part was 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 not there was sort of faint the formations would avoid each other bs right these we know that from the entirety of military history um at austerlitz the clash between the the, the cuirassiers was the impact of the actual bodies of men and horses was hurt at kilometers of distance. These guys were literally crashing physically into each other, like, you know, people broken in half, like, you know, broken spines, etc. This happened all the freaking time, right? You needed that, right? People got killed, destroyed. Um, you know, an orthopedist would have been very passionate with, you know, this kind of human types, like a Carolingian veteran, to see all the actual hits that these guys had been able to survive. Um, and all the possible accidents in, uh, involved in the training, too. I mean, not just in combat. In spite of this, the in order to have... Let's characterize psychologically also the horse, because, yes, he has to be aggressive, but he doesn't have to be that nervous. 
right? Uh, it doesn't have to be that impressionable. You need really this guy who who doesn't see any problem in literally smashing to another horse. Or at least, of course, there is always a... The horse is, is an animal of traumatic intelligence. Uh, it, it's shocking how much they understand. And what we tend to forget when looking at cavalry warfare is that the horse actually does participate into combat. Not just he sees the other horse as an actual opponent, but he understands what, what goes on. And if, say, there is, um, you know, a, an enemy infantryman that arrives, he will bite him. He will actually punch him with his hooves. Um, it, 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 it's something incredible. Um, and in, in the com actual fighting capacity that the horse has, how many people were maimed and and um, and crippled by by horses uh, in in actual combat is something uh, very uh, overlooked. Uh, but he had, in this sense, like the best soldier, like the the same knight. Right, these people who were they had to be agitated, they had to be nervous, they they wanted to simply charge at free reign. No, right, that's how at Zunta the Carolingians broke because they they were nervous, they were anxious, they were fresh records from the Rhineland, they didn't know the thing. So how it's very common, and that at least every Hema experience shows you is that every single imbecile can throw himself at somebody else. That's literally um, stupid human one point zero. Right, there is um, nothing special about that. That's what culturally underdeveloped people do. Right, every single uh, primitive will be able to do that. What you need as a killing machine, which thank God um, we have been gifted with the, with the military, is a person virtually devoid of um, not of emotions, but say um, capable of keeping emotions down, or controlling them, and exterminating the largest amount of human beings possible in the shortest amount of time, right? Which is essentially what warfare gets down to in practice, even though it's not ideally, the, the, let's say theoretically, the sole point. At least the, the point of war is compelling the enemy to fulfill your will through this act of violence, because of its indefinition. But this does also by Clausewitzian definition, practically pass through the extermination of large amounts of human beings, properly wiping them out physically. And this is, in fact, what the Carolingian knight technically is. What is the, Car what is the medieval knight in the first place? He's a person trained as an elite to basically take down 30 people before going down himself. Right? And this is what they literally did and lived by. And their brain was wired in a way that they would be able to do that, right? So the the same horse doesn't really have to freak out to be just hyper pumped, whatever. Uh, he had to be actually docile to the point of being guided only by gestures uh, and practically by the voice alone. This is a characteristic that we have seen also among the cataphracts, right? You had to rely. As a knight yourself, like you had to entrust your life to the horse as much as the horse knew that he was entrusting it to you. I'm not kidding, this is what happens. There is that chemistry you can have a good knight and a bad horse, you can have a bad knight and a good horse. In both cases, you will not have a good cavalry. In order to have a good cavalryman, you must have a good knight and a good horse that know each other, that rely on one another, to know what this is about. And this very specific psychological types that are able to carry out essentially the suicidal task without being too anxious about them. And I'm not kidding. I mean, this is literally what also in tradition, the doctrine of self-sacrifice and attaining the darkest forces you had to summon from within your, your own spirit in order to eventually triumph, uh, to break the, that mold of enemy resistance and taking them over as well. And their entire life, their entire value system was based in paganism, Christian times, exclusively on this sole concept. There was no greater glory, right, but achieving this. Every victory derived from this accomplishment. Um, and so eternal life, right, and a place in heaven. Uh, naturally, uh, the horse had to be vigorous enough to be able to support a considerable weight between the warrior, the weapons, 
and the harnesses um, but at the same time it, he didn't have to be slow either so because the, the attack was the more effective um, and the less dangerous for the attacker all right this is obvious right the cavalry by definition can only attack right cavalry does not have any capacity definitionally to defend anything right in order to defend with cavalry you have to dismount and become infantry otherwise you're done right and that's also why you have to charge in a way that is the, the most destructive um, as possible because um, there is no greater um, mo mo say moment of danger than the one after the cavalry charge has stopped if you haven't broken the enemy at that point you are the most vulnerable because you're in the midst of them and you're on a horseback which makes you disadvantage right of course in general of, of course these Carolingian knights were completely capable of spilling the brains of any uh, sort of squalid peasant that was trying to attack etc but again this was a time in which infantry still took down cavalry m more frequently than than we think and uh, when um, the same the, the same knight was habituated actually to dismount on a more regular basis also because central europe was much less uh you know tidy environmentally than uh, the now at the time it has had yet to be cleared to be in part colonized so the Carolingians heavily contribute to this as you know but you have to imagine the different the most different type of, of terrains um, and so not always the best ones for cavalry I mean in order to carry out a cavalry charge you have to make a video some video about this you need very precise requirement you can't do it all the time um, especially when it, it's a serious thing, so a collective one, right? The individual knight can do different things, and that's where, you know, it's not that he increases any actual chances of success, because, you know, why would you do it if you can do it um, with with a team, right? Um, you would just risk your life, but, of course, um, this uh, this would have stemmed also from the from the, the individual experience of the guy, I mean, not not all the time these guys and see that their sports was uh, because they were fighting with somebody else, right? These people were habituated to the to the most unspeakable kind of violence against anyone. Basically, there was no difference, especially in the in the Frankish world between a civil or military context. It's, it's a completely unknown mental category, um, and uh, you know, again, you you would have. Uh, you would have really liked also a psychiatrist to 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 analyze the 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 mind of a of a veteran of Charlemagne's, right? But for the actual functionality, not just of course the trauma that what these guys went under in order to become knights, first of all, um, which is a chapter we reserve for a horror video, but. Uh, you know this was normal you see the the thousands of of carolingian horsemen that we see in the largest expeditions so these were people who did so regularly and they they had a home they had a family they you know they lived in the world out there weren't automatons um drawn from you know some strange um uh, place they they were part they were the establishment, first of all, and, and they they embodied the world. Arguably, the entire, as we'll see better now, the entire world revolved around them because the the rest of society, so hundreds of people, um, at least, worked in large part just to provide them with again the the work, the the calories for for for. The, the military training for spending his life on horseback for building the uh, arm, say manufacturing arms and armor for indoctrinating them right you can't go at crusade if you're not uh, if you don't have all a, a functional ecclesiastical system a community so the entire world revolved around this I have to make a video about the cost of one of these knights was was enormous right and their mental um, 
condition was sub sublimating the sense of force of imperium. Like, why do the, the Franks basically become Roman emperors? Because they have literally received by God this mandate uh, due to, to their valor. And that's how they see that. They were perfectly aware of it. Right, and incredibly proud of the fact that God had entrusted the Romans to them as well. Um, there is, uh, in terms of the speed of the charge, another factor that is, especially against, I don't know, uh, our horse archers, that you couldn't have to expose yourself too long to arrows. Also because the horses were largely unarmored, we can't think of early types of caparis and stuff like that, even though the, the evidence is quite feeble. Uh, but in all this, the heavily armored guy was actually just uh, the knight. This would remain true for ever, because basically, you know, just the metal armor for 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 the horses, even in, in the historical peak in the later Middle Ages, was still a a, a margin, a very marginal minority fraction of, of the entirety of heavy cavalry itself. But in a sense it wasn't important because uh, the mass of the horsemen collectively trained and their relative speed was enough just to to gap um, the distance with the enemy. After all, uh, missile troops are just light troops. They can't hold terrain against the heavies, nor they can knock them out. So um, the degree also by which horses would be crippled, etc., that would be all a, a, a system, as you know, in the Middle Ages we dealt with that, especially um, f with the um, with the restau, which is a um, Provencal term that became sort of basically meaning restoration, sort of universal for uh, this compensation that, especially in, in the richest cities of medieval Europe, the community had to pay for the soul, for, for the crippled horses of the milites, right? This is just like in ancient Rome, like the equites, where the, uh, the, those who were provided by, by the horse, by the state, were basically the same concept because they were the closest to that sense of of achieving the imperium by individual valor. So the, in that way, society did revolve around them. I made a video about feudal Rome, if you're interested, in ancient times, actually, not in the medieval one, that tells you really what kind of brutally aristocratic mentality and in actual society the Romans stemmed from themselves. Um, so, of course, the best um, recipe in order for a for a cavalry charge is to, to do that with the, the right timing uh, charging the last hundred meters or so maintaining cohesion as much as possible gaining of course speed as much as possible in those in, in that last um, say space that you know already by practice or by knowing your men will not uh, break the formation enough and literally destroying human bodies in front of you like literally it, it's as if like they didn't have a consistence anymore after this impact now consider that this was happening at, at a speed of 45 kilometers per hour and that's crazy right um you know go on a motorcycle drive 45 kilometers per hour and, and just think about smashing to a, a target that in that sense must be soft enough for you to to to, to break through but even more frighteningly, as we were saying before, think that you're at 45 kilometers per hour, but in front of you there is somebody just like you that is arriving against you at 45 kilometers per hour. It's as if you had to smash at 90 kilometers per hour um, against a wall, right? In the worst of scenario. And, and just think that you are basically trained exclusively for doing this. And just think from a mental point of view what it means to be you also today compared to these men just for a second uh, and unfortunately for us the 8th century also in the fringes of the Carolingian Empire is the moment in which Christianity had removed the horses from the graves um, which 
prevents us from examin uh, examining the remains relating to the Carolingian and early feudal era uh, in order to, to find an answer with, to the problems of the origins of this type of cavalry, let's say a knightly horsemanship, if, if you want. Um, we can't use comparative means, we can't look again at, at the panoply, we, we can't look at the battles, so we have an idea, pretty graphic ideas, I'm trying to deliver it to you about what this type of um, horsemanship was about. But we still do miss lots of pieces. Uh, we do not have a clear picture, for example, of the selection of equine breeds suitable for the new type of warfare that clearly. We have an idea, more or less, um, through, of course, archaeology, through, um, say, just uh, equine genetics, as complicated uh, as, as it is. We mostly like, again, documentary evidence and clear uh, statistic data about that. Um, the written and iconographic sources, again, are not sufficient uh, and reliable either in this uh, field. If anything, a more precise indication could come from, indirectly, from agriculture, right? The growing importance that fodder crops, for example, had there a certain sign of an increase in equine breeding, but also of an increased demand for fodder for stronger and better cared for animals, which they required for it in greater quantity and especially in better quality. The horse is a very resilient animal. Uh, it can uh, even make 150 kilometers in a day. At most then it stops. That's also how you know messengers really really worked. Uh, it's a myth that information didn't travel fast while you know in a few weeks everybody knew uh, across Europe what uh, was needed. Uh, but uh, it, the horse is also a very delicate animal, not just it can be crippled easily by a wound, uh, an injury of any sort, uh, but it also requires very specific food and amount of food, fresh water, um, particularly good fodder right in a, in a you know in a regular way in a careful way and if, if you look at the fodrum in say in imperial in the imperial constitutions i mean the stacks that at the times even the entire communities battled um for think about um you know the was a carolingian legacy it was a certain amount of uh mostly natural resources literal fodder initially, then eventually the thing would be commutated in later Middle Ages, something more monetary, of course. But in those times, again, um, with um, barter, mostly scarce monetary circulation, etc., what you have is this fodder stored in certain warehouses, um, scattered across all the empire strategically at, at certain specific posts by certain specific communities, so that every time the army moved it would find enough food to move across Europe this is a this is how the Carolingians made it right sometimes by crossing thousand kilometers uh, with the, the communications of the time etc because they found the fodder there right uh, all right of course they would bring it in part with themselves but it was all for evidently highlighting the radical importance of cavalry in the Carolingian military system. I made a video about the Carolingian army organization. It's an old one, but say if you're interested in part, again, we will make something better about Carolingian logistics. But uh, if you're interested, especially in the relation between cavalry, infantry, etc., we will talk about that too as well. But I already made something on it. So it's essentially from um, other fields, other than military, that you can get, in fact, some inf useful information about uh, Carolingian horse breeding, right? 
the system of the so-called three-year rotation in crops consisting of dividing the cultivable surface into three parts of which was sown uh, one of which was sown in autumn with wheat and rye one in spring with barley oats peas chickpeas uh, lentils or broad beans one finally left fallow which was already known in Gaul since the 5th century, seems to have established itself decisively starting from the second half of the 8th century. That is precisely the same time of the rise of the, the Carolingian Empire, uh, as well as the spread of uh, the military use of this type of horse. It is particularly important because everything adds up right the three-year rotation in crops is normally something that you study in the medieval history chapter about the the, re the rebirth of the year 1000 but actually was already there uh, there is also technically nothing special about that right it's just basically making the most out of the land that you have which is something that um let's say the, the the Roman latifundium wouldn't so care much about especially at, uh, at the heyday of the empire because of course there were so many resources that it was not so important to invest in them the Carolingians as we've seen had pretty large estates themselves less than the Romans but still very much um, designed as we've seen to produce this mounted elite which uh, was definitely uh, working a lot to say the least um, if you look at the Carolingian conquest and expansions you realize that yes that even if the Franks had lots of resources they ruled over lots of people so they contributed uh, equally uh, to the to their war effort but we're talking the 8th century still the, the surplus is ridiculous and so this enormous conquests were also carried out with an equally enormous effort and in part, this three-year rotation system uh, would uh, would reflect that would be uh, a co a result of the of the pressure brought by by the system that was not really the logistically meant. Like just uh, the Carolingians needed these expeditions. If they had had a greater productivity, the empire would have not collapsed at some point. But still, it set the basis in many ways, and I talked about this in the videos about seigneurial Europe, post Carolingian Europe. In this local organization, again, every single place stored its fodder, it fortified, it sort of provided with these heavily armored elite, even in small numbers, but essentially paving the way for seigneurialization and castellation that after the fall of the empire became the blood and soul of Europe and from which essentially the, the continent re, uh, revived and booming like so in the following centuries and so having a lot to do with this local uh, organization capable of sustaining much bigger uh, states later on so um, this was a major change right the, the Carolingians surely as the Merovingians had been leaving off even of certain systems I don't know when, the, when Clovis marched into uh, Belgica he surely adopted many of the facilities the infrastructure that had been used for centuries by the Romans to, to supply their legions uh, on the Rhine there was a continuity in that power sharing by the Gallo-Roman elites with the Frankish ones everything stemmed from that um, it's as if this colonization went on you know uh, the, the Carolingians um, succeeded where the Romans had failed in uh, completing the conquest of Germany and uh, clearing it, um, um, reclaiming it, uh, and managing to install the system there as well. So it was a, a great uh, social engineering as well, right? It took, again, a, an enormous, especially military effort, but it managed to inculcate that sort of uh, feudal mentality that after all succeeded in spite of the of the fact that the empire uh, crumbled but that evidently left something organizationally in common to these various peoples and not just from a military point of view but still and significantly so I made lots of videos about the Carolingians and especially the post-Carolingian period that 
is one of the single most underrated uh, in, uh, in in Western history in the first place. Um, so through these agricultural, this uh, land exploitation uh, systems, etc., we uh, observe how the increased need for horses and stronger horses may have determined and increased the same need further, but above all for oats, and therefore constituted one factors that facilitated um, the abandonment of the Roman system of two-year rotation. This is actually just an hypothesis. We do not understand it clearly, right? The three-year uh, rotation was, again, this greater enhancement. Surely it was not much a Frankish versus Roman thing, also because the Franks had been ruling there from centuries already. They had used the same system, but evidently in the moment in which there is a revival of uh, Europe for whichever broader reason that I will not discuss here, of course, has to do a lot, however, with will, not necessarily climate change or whatever, it, you know, people did it, right? It's something that they, they went out for and accomplished it. Um, is, um, is, however, like, stemming from a, a, a greater level of social complexity, of political hierarchy, and so a capacity to manage uh, a much larger system than anybody had practically imagined. I mean, Charlemagne was uh, controlling and more functionally, so way more people and resources than Clovis had done. Um, so it's certain that, however, the qualitative improvement and quantitative spread of the horse at this point must have allowed further development in the agricultural field, right? The substitution of the ox for the horse in the work of the field. We see that the availability of horses increased, right? Not just ox were used uh, in the fields. Um, the horse was... Um, at this point, uh, introduced more uh, more frequently, it was already there, but it was essentially freed from the slavery of the yoke um, that uh, so sort of this breastplate actually that uh, had been employed at that point, suffocating him almost, um, taking away his strength, because evidently not much of it was actually needed prior. There is just more force invested at all levels of society um, and you had the shoulder collar instead allowing him to breathe better later you have this is not later than the 10th century so not that far away um, also the the hoof shoeing introduced making of the horse for the farmer an incomparably stronger and more resistant aid than the ox. In other words, you have the the horses invading, uh, say, different fields, not just the, the military one, uh, but also the productive system, uh, like at least increasing in uh, availability, in number, and so in, in the way it could be used, and also with sort of more mm, refined, expensive uh, tools to favor their their action, their work. So this is uh, definitely an indicator of also more wealth uh, invested by the aristocracy in this. Right, we see it at different levels. We know that society became more um, more vertical. And as such, we of course recognize that um, the aristocracy took over, and this is true for the, the entire feudal era, that probably the expansion system, that the enormous uh, output that we witness uh, in uh, high medieval Europe is essentially the product of a nobiliar management 
of agriculture, of trade, uh, etc. So it, it, it's a complex thing. We talk about it in videos about medieval economy. Uh, and in this, the elite nature of cavalry as well is highlighted. Uh, and of course, for this reason, of course, don't think that it was just uh, like a, a sudden change, right? The relationship between the war horse and the working one would remain to be investigated. We were not completely uh, aware what this entailed, but it may be that two different types of horse were used respectively. That's the most sort of obvious realities was true also in warfare like there were different types of horses for the various tactical tasks but it's also a possibility that the war horse once aged or for any reason become unfit for military labor passed to that of the earth uh, and uh, of the land and so the um, the, the, this would make sense it must also be said that the horse once unusual for other purposes could be slaughtered provided of course it was at least um, apparently healthy so there is all an economy the the details of which are relatively foggy as the same military dimension unfortunately but you can understand this from other from other culture from other contexts in short the horse was starting to act in the 8th century as a in discuss protagonist right up to this point as we were saying before uh, warfare had witnessed in Western Europe the prevalence of cavalry over infantry but infantry had maintained an important relevance uh, the mounted arm would not be able to dominate the Western battlefields until in fact the third fourth uh, of the 12th century and it remained unchallenged, albeit always using infantry as an auxiliary arm, um, as it did before as well, until the early 14th century, right? But if you look at Charlemagne's times, you already realize how important the horse was when the episodic of 791, which killed a larger number of horses, blocked the Frankish anti-hour offensive on that instance. So it was for many centuries... Without this animal, it would have not been possible to fight proper, right? Again, the, the military organization reflecting surely a political and social reality um, was not an option, right? The horse was like war. You, you made war only if you had cavalry at that point. Because those who were in charge were the ones who were able to afford this uh, on a regular basis and... Uh, say it provi providing also with some absolute advantage on other on other peoples, right? The myth that again the the east the steppe were more advanced, it's absolutely not true, right? It's from this time it's recognized by various sources that the Franks were these people that really were like the the broader Germanic peoples from the migration era that had cultivated this equestrian culture had, were, were acting as if they were the only ones to to be courageous, right? And that uh, their cavalry charge, they were, they were indisciplined. They had issues in that regard. Their, their states were sort of uh, unstable. But held their cavalry charges, those were nearly unstoppable. This is a, a trope that goes from the Seu de Maurice to, uh, to Anna Comnena. It, it's all truly uh, uh, constitutive, if you want, of a Western identity that is gradually in the high Middle Ages transforming itself in a Frankish identity, broadly meant. I mean, all the post Carolingian realms and then. Uh, the Normans that are essentially Western Franks when they conquer England and uh, and Sicily and and then influence Spain and tame Hungary and uh, I mean not the Normans in the last two cases but you understand this broader Frankish world right so uh, it can't really be denied that uh, the root of this ca heavy cavalry warfare had 
really stabilize the system through victory on the battlefields. All right, so you can see in the origins of this, as we were saying before, the accomplishments of Charles Martel, the uh, important role that the development of certain technical devices like the stirrup, for example, had favored this. Uh, there was a vision here, like these guys didn't wake up one day, of course, um, inventing mounted warfare, which was practiced since uh, before they existed as a people. Um, but the idea of increasing, right, grasping the possibility, potential of shock combat and enhancing that in a quite dynamic movement war is uh, extremely important. Um, this has to do with a strong maturity, uh, culturally speaking. I mean, uh, it's like the Bewegungskrieg, right? The idea that in order to handle these um, uh, squadrons of heavy cavalrymen, you we really must have acquired some greater mental capacity in the in the first place from a political or strategic point of view, right? That there was a maximization within the the realm of material capacities of the of the effectiveness of of your armies and, and your civilization. Um, and that's how essentially the Franks managed to tame so so many peoples, but nobody really managed to beat them. Um, and, and not just that they're fighting; These, those were other cultures that fundamentally had developed other systems. And so it's not just, of course, which, as we just said, a military thing, but it does pass through that uh, to the point in, in a feudal society of becoming identitary of these peoples. This is the elite that rules, right? The the tribal system had not made this. If it had, the, 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 the tribal system actually went down, as we will see now. Um, there is, again, also on this topic, such an enormous historiography. At some point, perhaps, we will cover that, uh, as far as especially the, the, the various influences, whatever. Not something that thrills me more than much. But at least the debate on, also the, as we were saying before, the the ratio of cavalry and infantry, for example. What were these armies really like on the field? It's not, not, not entirely clear. Everything seems to, again, have evolved very gradually. And so, still at this point, infantry that was often made up by the same elite uh, gave great proof of themselves, right? But there is no need that leadership and equestrian capacities are ever more uh, identifying with one another. I mean, mentally, they had always been there, right? Even among Tacitus Germans that made, comparatively to, to their neighbors, such, such poor use of cavalry, numerically speaking. But the idea, like in the Vandal Warrior, it's a, is that the hero is just a horseman that roams the world and molds it to his own image. It's uh, Alexander's model. It's what the Romans themselves saw in their... Um, in their in their sagas, uh, it was at the root basically of all the Indo-European mythology and in so many different, uh, basically in all the peoples of Europe, even the, the ones that had been century from from millennia at this point. Uh, the eighth century is also war, say a, a pretty violent period as well. Right, we see of course the triumph of the Carolingians, but this passed through an incredible amount of bloodshed, tensions and invasions. Think about the Battle of Tours, think about all the, uh, again, the, the chances, if you want, even the biological ones that we observed being so important for the Franks that were essentially a monarchy, more, more than a people, um, and that could have easily changed history in very less... Um, sort of resounding ways. Uh, but there is no doubt, again, that cavalry warfare would have been enhanced between, the, say, from, from this moment onward. It was just happening by, by itself from within even a fragmented Frankish realm. All right. uh, again, the Carolingians organized it better, right? but 
it um, it was already happening. It was already among the Franks before the Carolingians. Um, and uh, you can't unsee between the 8th and the 11th century the gestation and the first flowering of what we call, in fact, um, chivalry itself, at least in a, in a broader sense. And, and you can't help but see that this is a Frankish and then a French history, right? That, the, again, the cradle of this way of war emerged literally from northeastern Gaul, where the major power of the Franks was located, right, in the Romance era, but with this significant uh, Germanic uh, dynastic reinjection, especially with the Carolingians and their, also their military retinues coming from Austrasia. I made a video uh, some months ago of observing how fundamentally it was still a uh, uh, what would become a sort of Western Frank, an Austrian, you know, context that produced this, but surely um, the Franks were also a complex people, and they had also absorbed other populations, especially the Burgundians participated. I made a video about this as protagonists, right, at the same level of the Franks as they were fully integrated in the system, more than the Alamanni, more than the Aquitanians, that were still considered sort of foreigners at the time, albeit being under the Franks nominally. Um, and, you know, of course, in the High Middle Ages, what is, what other aspects of Western civilization, from architecture to science to poetry, was not predominantly a Frankish and a French thing. Right. Yes, there were important developments in Italy, uh, let's say lots of influences from Islamic Spain, but overall, right, even for the former, we're talking about the post carolingian context, so this is already a broader Frankish world, right, I made a video, in fact, about the Italic warfare recently that observes this, and it's quite fascinating to see, of course, declined in the various... Um, parts of the empire, all of which I would say contributed to an important degree to this. We will see it now because also the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, albeit the least developed of all, was uh, still the one who eventually in the 10th century took on the the Imperium, right, and also had quite a uh, quite a cavalry warfare there with, with the Magyar invasions and that threatened to destabilize its eastern half right in the, within itself um, we have seen uh, horse shoeing uh, increasing importantly in, in the ancient world uh, there wasn't such a thing right uh, there were the hippo sandals that were better than nothing but horse shoeing would be of dramatic importance to provide this heavy cavalry with that uh, capacity of, of grip on the terrain of, of you know say uh, possibility of the horse of performing uh, more intense um, stunts uh, that was required by this type of warfare primary right the slipping and falling of a horse during such as we've seen before dangerous uh, dynamic battle operations was always a serious matter if anything because if you fell from the horse you could as we've seen destroy yourself um, it's um, the, the slipping and falling of a horse uh, definitely with its heavily equipped rider both running was disastrous also for the horse naturally so you needed to enhance what you had already created the chances were very high that the horse would become lame and have to be put down if it was uh, seriously injured. So this was also an enormous cost. Um, the rider, uh, hampered by his weapons, would also be in the condition of, say, uh, becoming a victim of the enemies more easily. You can imagine all the disasters, all, again, the, the, the losses of war, like the, the combinations, the, the, uh, the, the, the twists of fate, right, that surrounded this enormous gamble of, again, um, 
charging at that speed with that weight and the forces involved. I mean, it's just always uh, like a Russian roulette. Um, hence the need to prevent the hoof from slipping or cracking. Uh, and some scholars said that the, the use of horseshoes seems to have already occurred during the 8th century not however in Neustria but in the provinces of former Roman Germany uh, this could be explained by the same reason why it became general only after the Magyar invasions in other words the Eastern Frankish Kingdom I have a video in store about that um, being more exposed first to the others, uh, but I mean historically, just uh, to the uh, to the old nomadic peoples that had stationed in the Pannonian Plain from the the Huns, again to the Magyars, would be first of all more of a frontier area, so more militarized in the first place, needing this more dynamic equestrian uh, warfare. And as such, just the place from which particular military gear would, would devil. I don't know, in the 13th century it seems that it's Eastern Germany that adopted first plate armor that spread eventually in a few years everywhere in Western Europe, showing that you know it would have happened anyway. But the idea that the, the Eastern peoples had something to do with that I made a video about the armor of St. Maurice, by the way, at the dome of uh, Magdeburg. That is, as you know, one of the first examples of plate armor in Europe. It, I explained this a little. I mean, this is not to say, as I was recalling before, that the, uh, the steps peoples were sort of more advanced, uh, in, in military speaking, to core. Right, but it's obvious that being nomads and having um, a more uh, important equestrian development, th there is no doubt they would um, be sort of the most obvious, let's say, quickest, right, closest source of equestrian military technology available for peoples that were developing their own cavalry in a sedentary context, but bordering the nomad world and um, therefore you know, needing uh, similar, I mean, the same solution basically to similar problem, uh, horse showing this context, and that this would arrive in fact within the, the Frankish world from the east rather than from a, a local development. This is also debatable, right? We do not really know. Uh, surely, uh, like w one thing that may have happened is that the Eastern Frankish Kingdom saw this spread earlier, and at levels that we can document more archaeologically because of the later Christianization and the fact that uh, they were sort of a more egalitarian people, which doesn't actually mean that they would ne provide us with better archaeological evidence, uh, mat material abundance in that regard. But it's sure that while these, I mean, this horseshoeing was around for a long time, as we've seen, and the, uh, just like the syrup, etc., and just the way it was adopted at this point, uh, was just, had been developing different places at the same time with different degree of spread for whichever reason. In any case, it's pretty self-evident that Carolingian France in the mid-8th century developed uh, to an unprecedented level in sedentary Europe combat on horseback determining uh, or at least justifying a profound uh, you know re, uh, restructuring not only of the military techniques but also the social structures this happened probably, uh, again, uh, was already going on. But the contemporaries would have appreciated it. I mean, they would have noticed that, of course, uh, life at the beginning of the, eighth uh, the beginning of the 8th century was different from at the end, right? That a lot had changed, that uh, 
the elites had definitely increased their power, that other peoples had been brought down, this had enriched the Franks further, the empire had been growing uh, to, to an unprecedented degree, uh, again, certain areas that had never been conquered now were brought down, uh, and from Italy to uh, Saxony, the others, or at least these were all coming to to fall at some point, to be conquered for good by the Franks. So it was a big deal, right? It passed through, again, pretty intense fighting also within the same Carolingian society. Uh, and this uh, definitely had an impact, in fact, on the, uh, on the individual, so like on the average uh, person that we will see now, all right? As we explained, as it's obvious, the heavily armored uh, warrior on horseback needed ever greater resources, assets to, to maintain and equip himself. Right? This could have not been possible without even a more implemented wealth concentration and the one that already had already existed in the Frankish world at, at the elite level. Uh, on the other hand, in front of him, um, the effectiveness of the old Germanic peasant infantry was vanishing. This also was going on for quite a while. I mean, if you look at other peoples that the Franks had brought, I mean, just in the way the Franks had settled themselves in Gaul, this had happened, right? I mean, Clovis had taken out all the other Frankish chieftains, um, peoples like the Alamanni, the Burgundi, the etc. had been knocked out and their elites had uh, in part being beheaded uh, and uh, the others had married into the Frankish ones. Of course these had autonomized themselves and so the Franks needed at this point to re-subject them but this had happened originally in the 6th century. In the 8th century 200 years later uh, the average Germanic freemen of those places had dramatically lost a great part of its liberty that already at the time it was not again even that particularly high, right? Uh, the advantage was living in a much more stable world uh, that really had sort of political um, social order that would in part shelter even the guy who had lost degree of liberty. This is how everything like, like seigneurial Europe had come to be in practice. Like there was also a, a degree of consensual acceptation of this right something that we're seeing right now as well i mean most people i think they just want to be maintained by someone and in many ways that they are right if you know that i don't make conspiracy theory etc but you know what, what are the big corporations all about right this is um not happening because there is some evil uh puppeteer who pulls the string of the world it's just people who are you know weaker and more stupid and more lazy and it's exclusively their fault if somebody profits from that right because where do you draw the line um, and uh, so the the social picture um, sees uh, during Carolingian times like the split between the aristocracy of war professionals at the higher level and the mass of rustics on the other side uh, that um, are the latter which are becoming factually in spite of the fact that it would still sort of maintain their own uh, their own liberty to some to some nominal basis but becoming much more similar to those not free or semi-free men at the lowest levels just made a video some weeks ago about the increase in uh, the power of ecclesiastical seigneuries in uh, 9th century Italy. We still have to make a video about the Stellinger revolt in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. I mean, everybody knew what was happening, right? It was a clear evidence of the fact that the system had brutally accelerated towards a loss in liberty of individual communities and uh, I'm not going to digress on it now because the video is already pretty long but in many ways these guys had called it on themselves 
in a way the head remained more isolated, the head been cut out from the power gains, the head not really done anything to implement much of another system, these other guys ha had been more effective, more competitive, and uh, you know, they, they took over. And these others, if they had had the capacity, they would have resisted. Uh, so it wasn't, right? This happened at many different levels, um, from entire peoples like the Saxons that were literally, you know, hammered down until they obeyed, and they they were turned into this uh, elite ruled system, to the the same social relations within, say, a, a peaceful, if not civil, context, right? We have seen it with the spread of uh, feudalism in the otherwise pretty civil public order of the Longobard Kingdom. Uh, it is something definitely increasing. Um, within the same France you see Charles Martel uh, stripping many uh, landowners, especially the church that had um, extended over previously royal, um, royally held assets from Merovingian times and redistributing this wealth to the um, to the in fact to the same Carolingian military regimes to start a bit the cycle of a military mm, replenishment and expansion that would at some point overstretch. There is a rise and a fall of the Carolingian Empire, it lasts basically one century or a bit more, 150 years of panic, also the Carolingians were actually an old, we, we know, the, the early ancestry being born in the late 6th century, um, they were already someone, right? Uh, as always in this system, if you hear the story, like it's all, it's, it's all about dynasties, right? And they're clientels, yes, but the, the top guys are the ones who rule. Um, in any case, the, the, the explosion, like the most violent rise, the expansion of the empire, the the reestablishment of, of the the reformation of the Western Roman Empire, like this all happened within the span of relatively few generations after all, and it had been carried out through warfare relentlessly, right? And uh, it would be interesting to, like again, hopefully we will talk about, uh, say, Carolingian politics soon. I mean, this is not just warfare. Um, in a in an absolute sense, right? Just as Clausewitzians, we know that it's politics more than else. But uh, in the French case, definitely the military and this uh, mounted elite definitely play a constant role, just as an anthropological model for the revival of the same imperium. And so the ecumenic mission in front of God. Uh, for the rest, in fact, you have it fall. You have the exhaustion of the system. You have the disarmament of the poorest farmers uh, that was uh, motivated by, also among the others, economic reasons. Um, they, but not only, right? Uh, it, it's also in this case a political issue, right? They prefer to be under someone powerful and affluent that received further resources from the top rather than uh, in many ways uh, you know trying to implement the system as the local communities that they had been they losing de facto the, their liberty uh, medieval society far from the old customary juridical elements will surely remain a polemocracy a society order for war in which war will also take a preeminent value on a social level but this also means that the average person that cannot fight uh, is is cut out, right? It, it must be channeled in another role that is the one of supporting the warrior. Uh, and in fact, the strong, healthy, rich laymen, uh, there were also actually ecclesiastics that fought um, uh, without too much of a problem, right, in the, in, uh, in the Carolingian world, and we'll talk about them at some other point, but bishops had to at least march with their army in reaching the front, and if they wanted, they could also fight, it was normal, really, at the time, many were lay abbots or something like, think about Neithard, 
the source for the Battle of Fontenoy. He was a grandson of Charlemagne. He died eventually in, uh, if I'm not wrong, in Aquitaine during a Viking ambush. But, um, you know, you have this this lives literally spent like all these assets, this, uh, this, um, their, their wealth spent for war as well. So the, the guy, however, that did so was the old, so the, the, the warrior, right? The, uh, the, what would become the knight technically, the object of particular juridical prerogatives because of course he was the one always remember that who bore the imperium just the other day I made a video about the Cingulum Militaris in late antiquity and here things are as far as the sword and I made multiple videos on the topic really uh, sort of way more symbolic right uh, we, we talk about the sacralization of the sword the passage also from paganism to Christianity how that happened technically uh, without being actually that different, and especially in these cases. Uh, but the guy had, as we've seen first and foremost, to be professionally qualified through years of training, and therefore, as far as that, free from worries of other nature. Um, and he will be, in fact, a warrior. Anyone who does not meet these requirements would be downgraded to procurer of goods essentially to be used for the maintenance of the same fighter and his very life will be protected only by the presence of the same um, so it was a highly functional system uh, in times of crisis you have this loss of individual liberty the system shrinks you have suddenly some fears and practical needs that you didn't think you could have up to that point you're sort of fooled by your own uh, especially that, say that wealth that is actually the elite that has provided you with that now you know you don't know how to, to, to maintain because you're somehow convinced that things work deterministically and materialistically and they actually don't um, and this was a much more messed up world of course than the one we live in so that I mean warfare within the same franchise would be not that strange I mean for, even for the average peasant to, to see that of course different areas of the Carolingian Empire had different degrees of liberty loss. You can argue that actually France was the place where the peasantry had been under earlier and faster than places like Germany or Italy or even southern Gaul, telling the truth, right? So this, it's a, again, it has to do with a bit the story of it. All these, again, all these countries had been aristocratic to some degree, but there were also important differences, and uh, the the Franks managed to take over. Uh, aside from the other things, also because again they they were already shaped in that way from before, uh, and war and all the activities that trained for it, hunting above all will customarily become the prerogative of the upper layer of secular society, right? The work will be the obligation of the inferior, the lesser people, um, the, especially, in fact, the, the, the less honorable aspect of which will be underlined. This also existed, but it's reinforced because there is a stark divide now, you know, a starker one between the elite and the rest. Right, and there is all an ideology behind that. Um, the arduous hard work is, of course, uh, a punishment. Right, uh, the the freeman must not work by definition, because he bears arms, he commands. Right, and the idea of, of work, of course, is you know that those who do it's because they do not have any other nobler mean to to sustain themselves they're not even technically in fact um, doing it on their own they're ordered to do so they're ruled by somebody else and this is of course uh, a consequence of the original sin for which these people are condemned right labor comes from this uh, and it, 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 it's also the fruit of the cumulation of your ancestors sins which uh, of course if you look at this gradual 
a depletion, of course, of the individual liberty was particularly fitting because once upon a time people had been freer and now uh, you know especially in contrast with all the grandeur of the Carolingian Empire was now crumbling these people were sinking even further as they had already been doing from uh, from from ever and so this had enormous problems and implications naturally again material culture historically will improve the 8th century actually in itself had witnessed this uh, political expansion also thanks to the increase in absolute wealth um, without which uh, you know you could have not even fielded this structurally this large amounts of heavy cavalry next to which again always infantrymen the levies etc would, would serve we'll never forget that um, but from a moral, psychological point of view, you, you must think about this. The world of the medieval West would feel, but this, in a sense, was normal for basically all the other cultures. Actually, the West was much more egalitarian than other places. Um, but as far as we are concerned as Westerners, like until the bourgeois ethics came to sort of an inch, uh this belief which is the traditional belief um, for reasons that now I, I will not criticize but you know what I think it ruined the world in the last couple of centuries to an important degree material well it's not everything it's at least uh, we accomplished a lot also traditionally wise because nothing can succeed without traditional value but the disorder through which this has happened is because of the lack of form in moral force and so the idea that you don't have to fight really you don't have to be a ruler or a commander or whatever to know what it's right in this world something very recent as an idea before everybody accepted this order including the peasants I mean of course we do not have much of their opinion on this but we understand as always like today you know that people want to be ruled over right just in fact a, a, a populistic fort estate or paranoid mentality can believe that uh, you know a people does not deserve entirely what what happens to them uh, there is no such thing like okay here I stop and the government begins if if, if you decide that uh, the government doesn't have the this the the moral support, uh, the decisive moral support of the population. Uh, I mean, the people, at least as a whole, decides that, and individually. Uh, this is even more problematic because if you want to make a change, you must uh, work to to create a community, and nobody cares. So eventually, they will just stay at the window and blaming, uh, but not really doing much, concretely. But um, the idea is, of course, that there is a dramatic split in ants during the 8th century, from the 8th century forwards, of those men that, in two marked categories, by the guilt of the progenitors, those who, like Christ, will redeem the same society with the, their, the, the blood of their fighting, so their self-sacrifice in holy combat, in, literally in, in actual war, and think about the in this sense why the elite is in charge and those who like Adam and Eve after the expulsion from the earthly paradise will redeem it with their sweat and work for making the elite achieving that so being still sort of trail of the elite actually when we talk about today's elites uh, again you can argue that of course they have nothing to do with those elites they don't have the backbone, but equally so the people don't, right? That's the reason why there is that elite. So don't flatter yourself if you're an average person, because there is literally nothing to be flattery about it, all right? Um, so in all of this, it, it's, you see, it's always a complementary picture. You can't have one without the other. You can't be the average person thinking to be special just because they exist and blaming the elite without actually doing anything about that because factually that that's what happens 
and it's always very complex but at least you should be aware also that your individual power is less because you didn't achieve even what just the elite would. so you should pose yourself some question uh, and uh, everybody essentially gets what they deserve this is not reinvented in the 8th century it was traditional knowledge it was all, always there it was the same reason why after all up to a certain point people had defended their own liberty individually even though it had always remained a bit of a uh, bit of a mm, say a myth right? an, an ideal in a chimera as well but there is no doubt that throughout these early medieval crises the entire medieval age at least um, would um, would feel this uh, mood right and there is not just the warrior and the and the worker but as you know the third element that is the clergy the priesthood um, the primary task of the clergy is prayer um, because again you have to train the warrior to be a good warrior uh, with the right beliefs, with the right objectives, with the right wisdom. This is at the root, again, of the investiture controversy, but what's of both, right? That's what began between Charlemagne and the Papas, even though it was an old problem. Uh, and uh, again, every step of the way, I would like to digress on these topics because I can't wait to make so many videos about each one of them, plus the, or the ones I already made, because it's, I think, what people miss the most in the interpretation of the Middle Ages is not much about the topic in itself. And I, in fact, I feel angry at not being able to simply deliver to you the, the immediate concept. But, you know, I think if you are older followers of mine, uh, what I'm talking about, right? Um, so when you look, however, at these uh, estates, you realize the complementary functions that still maintain a different degree of honor. And the interesting thing is that you can never say fully, you know, that simply belonging to a category makes you, you know, wear another, because you can have different things at a time. Think about the monastic military orders. Uh, what are those? Are they the priesthood or are they the the warriors they're both actually there are some laborers some commoners that eventually will be able to challenge the knights in open field and even defeating them so what are those right uh etc like there are so many many warriors that at this point uh, especially when knighthood was opened right that they had to serve just because of their wealth we've seen it in the laws of recruitment by Eistulf in the 8th century Longobard kingdom that would have just to I mean they were businessmen they had land, they had cattle they had horses they would go at war sometimes but sometimes they wouldn't like that too much, we've seen it also in the crisis in the video about um, 14th, 15th century French army organization, a bit explaining what was the crisis of the French army during the Hundred Years' War, at least why all those defeats. And you understand that these problems recur still today and they're deeply intertwined at all levels of politics, of the military, of society. You can't never stop, right? There was someone the other day asking me, but why don't you talk about modern, uh, I mean, contemporary events? Uh, criticizing, like, you know, finding analogies with the past. I wanted to answer this. Maybe one of these days we'll make a Q&A video. But the point is that you should study history exactly to understand that every situation is different, that you can't find these similarities, but that till you learn how to measure them in that specific situation. And so making a historical research on this and that time, you can't quite have a guru or, uh, like me the, who answers you, like telling you, look, these are similar. And uh, so that's how you should go with, right? Of course, 
you know, you I est I estimate my followers, my subscribers to be intelligent enough to understand that you know how to handle my my content that are sure uh, surely aware that this answer of mine is along the pattern of you should be able to learn it by yourself through the history that I teach in this sense never think that you can look at the today's events and the ones of the past as if first of all you knew contemporary events just because you live in them or you can just look at the past because without studying it you must do both and it's extremely difficult uh, and everybody can get tricked that easily uh, especially at the beginning so it's not my I have my ideas of course but it's not the simple explanations that alone will answer you in that way and so I think that it's particularly important to be also humble in that regard and accepting that there is so much that we need to learn and so just sitting here doing nothing will not really do it that's why I also make Schwerpunkt among the other things because I hope I can deliver this awareness and, and yeah and life is, is tough right but history does help with that and I think I'll be making more videos about this sometimes soon for today however I stop it here uh, we will keep talking about Carolingian warfare uh, Carolingian history Frankish history in general it's very important I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time